we'll talk about Jesus and, and his love today. But I think the true definition of love might be something that just happened. I just took a cough drop out of my mouth and handed it in the bare hand of Martha. <laughs> and she took it. <laughs> so I, I'm thinking that's love. <laughs> oh my. I can't blame Brian's coat for my not having a voice today. So I'll do the best I can. <clears throat> Many of us grew up with a lot of Christmas traditions. Maybe even some pretty weird ones. And you didn't know they were weird at the time, but later in life you found out that, you know, nobody else really did these things, and maybe you just had a kind of a strange family. In Japan, they don't serve turkey on Christmas. The tradition is Kentucky Fried Chicken. A Kentucky Fried Chicken marketing guy got that started a bunch of years ago, and it just took off. So now they don't catch the hen and butcher it and cook it. They just go to KFC for Christmas. In Caracas, they rollerblade to mass on Christmas Eve. In Germany, after the Christmas tree is decorated, the last ornament hidden on the tree is a glass pickle. And the child who finds the pickle either gets an additional present or they get to open the first present. Some families brave Black Friday as a Christmas tradition. Anybody do that? Not, not me. There's no way I'm going out in those stores on that day. In Ukraine, they decorate their trees with fake spider webs and glittery spiders. The legend has it that a poor family couldn't afford to decorate their Christmas tree and the children in the house were crying. So at night, the spiders decorated the tree in sympathy of the poor family. We in the United States have mall Santas. Anybody ever sit in the mall Santa's lap? Come on, we probably all have. In the Netherlands, they get gifts in their shoes. We hang stockings by the chimney. Some in the United States attend SantaCon. Yes, yeah, SantaCon. People all dress up like Santa and they meet in New York City and they hang out. It's like a Santa convention. They have flying witches in Norway. They have crimson Christmas trees in New Zealand. We hang mistletoe and then we try and steal a kiss from our sweetie under the mistletoe. In the US, they kind of knock back some eggnog. In the US, we do Christmas 5K runs. We do marathon runs. People are suggested to be dressed up as Santa in Christmas regalia. Anybody running a marathon today or a 5K? No, okay. That's because John's not here. We got Yule logs. Anybody do the Yule logs? Anybody put it up on your TV screen? Oh, guess what we did this year? We put up the Yule log with the puppies. The little golden retriever puppies so falling cool. all over. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and all of us as a family sitting there going, oh, oh. It's just so. How many do fruitcake? How many ever have gotten a fruitcake? Those are the nastiest foods known to man, I swear. Fruitcake. A family I know bakes a birthday cake for Jesus, and they sing him happy birthday, the traditional birthday song. I always thought it was funny how, though, that the dad's cake and Jesus' favorite cake are the same kind. I love that our worship service last night is one of our traditions, Amen. that that's how we worship on Christmas Eve. Michael and I have both said that that's what starts the Christmas season is our, our Christmas Eve service. I don't know that, that Christmas can ever come without you guys playing horns. That's, that's good for me. The family that bakes the cake does so to teach their kids that this is the birthday of Jesus. And remember we said maybe. 
Last Sunday we said that Jesus' birthday probably isn't December 25th, though it does have a 1 in 365 chance of being right. We don't know when Jesus was born, that's the truth. And, and yet, I will tell you this, that December 25th wasn't just a random day that they picked off a calendar. Instead, remember what I said, here's what happened. About 300 years after Jesus was born, the early church said, hey, we wanna set aside one day to celebrate Jesus' birth, to have a birthday for Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. So they picked this day that was in the middle of what's called the winter solstice. And it was thought to be the coldest and the darkest day of the year, December 25th. The coldest and the darkest day of the year is the day that we are going to celebrate that Jesus was born. And remember, he brought light and life into a cold and dark world. That's how December 25th came to be. Here's what the Apostle John said. Let me read to you from John 1. I'll read verses 1 to 3 for background. Remember when John tells the Christmas story, he goes back to the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. Remember John later describes the capital W-R-D word as Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Jesus, the creator, we see here. Here's the part I want you to hear, verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas, that in this cold and dark world, light and life has come. I understand that excuse me, many attend church on Christmas, some of them just as a tradition. I also understand there are many who are experiencing the darkness and the coldness of this world in a way that you've never had before. <clears throat> and maybe what you think today is tradition is really God trying to break through into your world with the light and life of Jesus the Christ. And it's not an accident that you're listening to this today. It, it's not an accident. The Apostle Luke tells us the story of the very first Christmas, the night where the announcement was made. Here is Luke 2, verses 6 to 11. While they were there in Bethlehem, the time came for the baby to be born, and she, Mary, gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. There was no room in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. <coughs> and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, remember the angel speaks in the darkness of night, do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And so into this dark, cold night, this declaration is made, good news of great joy. And let's face it, we don't get much news that is good nowadays. Instead, when we get news notifications, it triggers in us something and, and we're suddenly aware that something is about to happen and usually it's not good. So we sort of brace ourselves. Is there a new variant? Is, is there some new mandate that's coming out? Are gas prices going to go up again? Is there some horrible catastrophic event that's happening around the world? And, and it all happens in real time. And it, it all happens right on your phone, right on your wristwatch. In real time, there's some new prediction of the end of the world or doomsday or impending doom. And that's the kind of news stories we get on a regular basis. Sometimes we kind of find ourselves looking for them. 
There's actually a term to describe this. It's called dooms scrolling. And doom scrolling is when we're no longer receiving the news. It's when we become consumers of the bad news that's out there, where we go looking for it, can't pull ourselves away from it, have to know what it is. We're kind of wired to pay attention to things that are bad. And, and what we know is that, what we know is that this is a dark and this is a cold world. And I don't have to give you a lot of examples to make my point because we know. This is a cold and dark place. And so the Bible would teach us that into the cold and dark night, the Christmas message brings us light and life. The message of scripture is not to put your hope in this world, in this life. Jesus came for you to put your hope in him. And so the angel comes and gives good news of great joy. And, and what makes it good news of great joy is that a savior has been born and he's come at just the right time. God's timing is always perfect. A savior has been born to save us from our sins. Came across the website last week <clears throat> and the website kept track of, of letters that kids left for Santa. I especially like this one written by a young boy. It said, dear Santa, there are three boys living in my house. Jeffrey is two, Jared is four, and Jake is seven. Jeffrey is good some of the time. Jared is good some of the time. Jake, Jake is good all the time. I am Jake. <laughs> and we chuckle at that, but I think that mentality of a seven-year-old tends to be the spirit that we have we sometimes try not to think of ourselves as someone who needs to be saved from sin. Because we're good all the time, right? Or, or at least we're not bad all the time. Instead, what we do sometimes is we compare ourselves to someone else in society. And we think, well, you know what? Compared to them, I'm doing fine. Compared to this person, this guy over there, I I'm just OK. So we try to grade ourselves on a scale, but the Bible says that all of us have sinned and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And the only hope that we have is to be saved by Jesus. Folks, it's the only hope we have. If we want heaven to be our home, if we want to experience the eternal life that God has promised us, that only happens through Jesus the Christ. That's the good news of great joy. That's the good news that, that God has made a way. Now we said this announcement of a savior is made in Luke chapter two, but it's not the first time that announcement is made. First time it's made is all the way back in the first book of the Bible in Genesis chapter three. We talked a little about this in one message. We remember the scene as we watched Adam and Eve sin against God. And the moment they sin, the world gets colder and darker. The moment they sin, they separate themselves from God. They separate themselves from each other. They separate themselves from nature. It's like everything now is out of sync. And in that moment that we read the first announcement of the Christmas prophecy, the Christmas prediction, the Christmas promise of a savior that would come. Remember God said to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And then from then, from Genesis all the way through to the New Testament to where Jesus is born, what we see is God preparing the world that God is planning and working and being intentional to prepare the world for a savior. And I think it shows just how great the gift of Jesus really is. It shows just how loved we really are. I came across this video a couple weeks ago and I watched it and it had a pretty strong impact on me. Let me show that to you now. 
Kel, can we play the video? This is what I wanted you guys to see. Thanks, Kelly. When you wipe the tears out of your eyes, I have to be honest with you and tell you this is a commercial for an exercise company. They're trying to convince you to start working out no matter your age, but it's genius. And what I love about the video is that for a long time, people don't understand what the grandfather is doing. They can't make sense of it. They see him working, they see him hitting the alarm. They see him getting up. They see him getting out. They sit, see him being intentional. They don't understand what's happening, but he has this moment in mind that he's working towards. And he puts the picture of his granddaughter in front of him and he uses that to motivate him. And he's reminded of his love for her and this moment that he wants to have with her. I love that video because to me, it's an example of what we see throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament where Jesus is born. We see God the Father who loves you, loves you so much that he's preparing the world for his son. A son that one day will be lifted up. So we celebrate that the Savior was born and he comes at just the right time, just the right time. One of the things I realized as a pastor over the years is that my timing is certainly not God's timing. I see things unfold one moment at a time and, and he see, sees things all at once and he knows it all. And I pray for certain people at certain times to really understand God's love for them 
and I don't understand why it's so hard or what's taking so long and why, why doesn't God move in some dramatic way and then at just the right time, just the right time, Jesus breaks through. And I really do believe, listen, I, I really do believe that for some of us, for some of you, that this is that moment. Maybe it's somebody who's listening to us today halfway around the world. God's been working in your life for this moment. Sure, there's been some hard things that have happened. And there have been some things that you were leaning on that aren't there anymore. And he wants you to realize and recognize that your one savior is Jesus. And your one true hope is in him. Folks, the other thing that makes such a good such good news is when the angel makes this announcement he says it is for all the people we, we talked about that a little bit last night hardly the way we'll talk about it now and it's not just for some people it's for all people folks jesus is for all people think what makes good news good news is when you're included in it that makes a difference. The fact that this announcement gets made to shepherds kind of proves the point. Remember the shepherds in those days, they're not looked upon with favor. They lived out in the hills. The word shepherd sometimes was used as a derogatory term. Oh, you're just, you're like those shepherds. Smelly, dirty, unsophisticated. They weren't just thought to be physically unclean, religiously they were unclean as well. The spiritual leaders kept them at arm's length. They couldn't come into the religious community. They weren't even allowed to witness in court. These are the people whom the angel appears to, to declare light and life. The light and life of Jesus has come. And if it's true of them, it's true of you. I like what the angel doesn't say. The angel doesn't say, hey, I bring you good news of great joy and you're going to get to see Jesus, but are you really going to wear that? Why don't you go shower first and, and, and maybe put on something presentable? The angel asks them to just come as they are. And here's another thing I noticed. How about the wise men? The wise men and the shepherds, they are two completely opposite ends of the social spectrum. And, and, and both are called. Think about what God is saying. This story, this Jesus is for everyone. A preacher in a bigger church tells this story that on the same Sunday, it was the Sunday before Christmas, he said when they looked in their offering plate, someone left an offering of a check of six figures. An offering check of six figures. He said the next day in the mail, he received an offering from a prisoner in the local jail. The offering was prison stamps. The prisoner didn't have any money, but he does have a job in prison. But in the prison, they don't pay you in dollars. That's not their currency. Their currency is stamps, and stamps are good, well, they're good only in the prison. You use those stamps then for snacks and supplies and for comforts. The prisoner sent in his offering. His was stamps. So here's what happened. In a 24 hour period in this church, they received a six-figure offering and, and they also received stamps. Folks, what a beautiful reflection on Christmas of how generous we can be because this Jesus was born and is our Savior. How does that happen? Why does that happen? 
It's because it's for all the people. It's for all the people who love Jesus and they just have to worship and they have to give. A Bible student was working on a better understanding of Luke chapter 2 and verses 10 and 11. Remember that, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town, <coughs> excuse me, today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. He thought, he thought about that word all, and he looked up its translation, all the people. Man, that's kind of a broad term, all the people. So he started to just use the alphabet as a way to mark down and write down all the people that God loved. These all people. Here's what he wrote. I hope you have as much fun with this as I did. A, airline pilots, attorneys, ambulance drivers, artists, acrobats, astrologers, auditors, the Amish, Anglicans, adulterers, agnostics, the atheists, the addicts, the arrogant, the absent-minded, all people. B, babies, babysitters, Baptists, boy bands, blondes, brunettes, blue hairs, the bullied, the, bull the people being bullied, the bossy, the bitter, the bummed out, the burned out, the broke, the broken. Bees sound like all the people too. C, Canadians and Cambodians and Cubans and Mark Cuban and CEOs and custodians and cooks and crooks and cutters and criers and crystal meth users and critics and cat lovers and critics of cat lovers. <clears throat> Think it was all the people. Dads and Democrats and dishwashers and deadbeats and drag racers and drag queens and drama queens and disc jockeys and the dude who's going to cut you off on the way home. He is Elvis impersonators and environmental activists and evolutionists and exaggerators and emoji users and Eminem and yeah, it's on there, Eagles fans. <laughs> Faithful and the faithless and the fearful and the fearless and the forgetful and the forgotten and the frustrated and the finicky. Gee, the good, the grateful, the generous, the greedy, the glamorous, the gullible, the grouchy, the guilty. It's still all people, right? The hard workers, the hardly working, the harsh, the homeless, the homosexuals, the homophobic, the Harley riders, the hipsters, the helpless. India. Indiana, introverts, influencers, illusionists, IRS agent, agents, and the irresponsible. J is janitors and jugglers and late night jammers and late night talk show host named Jimmy. K was funny because it just said the Kardashians. <laughs> Chloe and Courtney and Kim and Kendall and Kylie and they even threw Kendall in there or, or uh, Kanye in there and all of the Karens. L was lazy and loud and, and the lousy and the lethargic and landscapers and lawyers and the lunch ladies and the latte lovers and the left-handed. M was was mimes and Mennonites and missionaries and moms and the meticulous and mischievous and the militia and Miley and Madonna and Marilyn, both Monroe and Manson. And was the nerdy, the needy, the narrow-minded, the naive, the narcissistic, Nicki Minaj, the New York Knicks, anybody who loves Nickelodeon. O is the obese, the obnoxious, the old-fashioned, and every name you've ever read in an obituary. 
Pewas preachers and pimps and politicians and police officers and protesters and progressives and pornographers and prostitutes and pill poppers and the pushy and the prideful. It still seems like all, doesn't it? God loves all. He, he sent Jesus for all. He sent him for the quiet and the quitters and the questioning and the queers and, and Queen Latifah. For Russians and Rwandans and real estate agents and Republicans and road ragers and the responsible and the rebellious and the reclusive and those with regret. He sent them to the sassy and the spunky and the sarcastic and the serious people and South Africans and Somalians and smokers and strippers and everybody who's an internet surfer. The timely, the telemarketers, the television reporters, the trainers, the teenagers, the transgressors, the transgenders, the talent, the timid, and those who are just a train wreck. V was the victorious, the victims, the vegetarians, they had their own group, uh, vaccinated people, people from Virginia. W was the well-balanced, the wicked, the warrior, the whiny, the welfare people, the windshield washers, the waitress, and the waitress who works at the Waffle House, and the woman who weighs you into Weight Watchers. X was a smaller group. X-ray technicians, the xenophobic, the xylophone players, and those with the X factor. Why the young, the yappy, the yuppies, the loud, the yawners? I'm sorry, it was the loud yawners. Z was the zealous, the zany, and the zookeepers. D did I get them all? Ah. Yes, Michelle, I missed you. We'll use this you. Not Y-O-U. And we'll say young you, and adolescent you, and old you, and you without makeup, and you without muscles, and you at your best, and you at your worst, and you at your confused, and the content you, and the timid you, and the silly you, and the self-conscious you, and the arrogant you, and the unemployed you, and the entitled you, and the fearful you, and the lonely you, and the guilty you, and the bitter you, and the broken-hearted you, and the adorable you, and the unlovable you, and the single you, and the divorced you, and the separated you, and the widowed you, and the angry you, and the cynical you, and, and the, coward, uh, the cowardly you. I am bringing you good news of great joy and it is for all the people. A savior has been born for you. Remember, that's what the name Jesus means. It means savior. Every time you say his name, you're speaking salvation. Jesus saves. And so he is where we put our hope this Christmas and every day after. I have one more video for you today. I don't know if you've seen this video. It came out after the tragic tornadoes hit Kentucky. I think it was about last December. Remember they brought such devastation to an area there, parts of Kentucky? But there's a story of a man named Jordan Bynes. And he and his family, they rushed into the basement and they huddled together under a mattress just before the tornado hit. And a property that had been in his family for generations was almost completely destroyed. But the family was okay. Now Jordan had played the piano for years and he thought it was just a kind and uh, a, ki a kind of quiet time and personal moment right after everything calmed out after such loss. So he played, but it got recorded. Kel, can we play this video? 
I ask you to listen to what he's playing. It's soothing and calming, and uh, I think we all probably could have used a little bit of that this weekend. Thanks, Scott. Anybody get the song? The storm damage in these small town communities is nothing short of catastrophic. It's nothing like anything we've ever seen or dealt with. I was on my way home from work. I got about two blocks. Looks like we got a lot more. Tornado kind of pushed me off the side of the road. I started off walking, never got to the house. And, and this is. There we go. Thanks, Kel. Michael, I saw you shaking your head. You recognize that hymn he was playing. There's something about that name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. That song was written by Bill and Gloria Gaither over 50 years ago, I think 52 years ago. And it's been sung for generations in the church. After seeing the video, someone sent a copy of this video to Bill Gaither and asked him to comment and pray. Bill Gaither texts back one lyric from the hymn that he wrote. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. And he's right. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. Anything or anyone else you put your hope in will disappoint you, it'll let you down, and it'll not hold up in the end. It is only in Jesus you can be saved. There is just something about that name. And so this Christmas we celebrate that our hope is in him. And our hope is in him alone. And it's good news of great joy. And I think we agree it's for all the people. Amen? Amen. Do, do we understand that? Because if we don't, I can go over that list again. No? Okay. <laughs> Let's pray. Oh God, thank you for this wonderful present and for the presence of Jesus. You took care of it all. And Father, we stand in your glory. Humbled. humbled next to Jesus. It is in his name we pray, amen.